we're looking at design in the garden in very different ways, so different intentions and different contexts. And our next speaker is Paul Cheney, who um, runs a project called Field Club, and this is really designing a sort of way of living, a sustainable infrastructure from scratch, and it's in a completely different context, the urban context, that Something and Sun operate in, because Field Club is four acres of field um, near Falmouth in Cornwall, and this is the place where Paul has lived for the last four to four years, and he has documented his efforts to live there. So this is both, in a sense, there's a link to the Guangzhou Design Biennale, because it's both the light side of living in the country and the dark side of it. He lives off grid, yeah, so he doesn't have any um, utilities fed to it, and he brings in minimal resources from the outside. So I'll just check if the system's ready, and then we'll go on to Paul. Are you ready to start? Okay. Actually, just in case this does take some time, Paul, do you want to come on stage and we'll start talking while they're setting it up? So Paul is an artist who has been working on Field Club for many years, and it's an interdisciplinary project which, as I said, documents his efforts to live on, with minimal external resources on a four-acre Field. So, if we mm. sit down, it sure. will be more comfortable. So, Paul, can you explain how the concept of Field Club came about? Okay. Um, I've always been interested in this idea of being, uh, experimenting with self-sufficiency. And when I talked to, pe to friends and peers about it, uh, it usually got a lot of criticism. And the, these two main criticisms were that... Um, one, in the UK, there isn't enough land to, to go around for everyone to be self-sufficient, so I was, in effect, being, take, making a very selfish choice. And the second criticism was that uh, there's this the prerogative of, of progress. There's this kind of idea that somehow um, a move back to the land would be to compromise the last 10,000 years of human cognitive evolution, which is not what I think, but some of my friends might say it's true. I don't know. <laughs> but... Yeah, so we, we set up the project to, to really um, start to interrogate these two problematics. And then once we started, we realized that we were just opening floodgates to this, this huge unknown. And we really wanted to start the project from a position of not knowing. So uh, we, we kind of left behind any, tried to leave behind any rhetoric that we had about green issues or sustainability before we started, just to sort of al allow us to be in a space of not knowing. And you've explained very clearly what your friends and colleagues' objections to the project were. Why did you decide to do it? Why did... Yeah, what were the positive reasons that you... Well, I mean, you've got to do something with your life, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've always been interested in this. I've always... When I was a kid, I worked on farms, you know, I grew up in, in Somerset, and uh, it, it kind of made sense that... And, and, it made sense to me that this, this was a, an area where the, the, a lot, lots of people are doing it. So lo lots of people live off grid, lots of people are trying to be self-sufficient, but uh, there's not so much analysis going on, and there's not, not so much dissemination that doesn't sort of fall into this rather horrific kind of hippie, twiggity genre, which I find a bit annoying. So I, I decided to start to use my art practice, really, to, to, to address it. So what stage in your life were you at when you decided to go ahead? Um, well, when I started... Ah, oh, there we go, images. excellent. Well, just to answer your question, I, w I wasn't working at the time, so I had time on my hands, and it, it, it was just a very compelling thing to do. And it feels great to be outside, and so, yeah. Shall we, go, well, shall we move no, on exactly. to it? Yeah. Um, so Paul okay. starts by telling us all about Field Club. Okay. Um, so, a bit of a technical hitch. Uh, this is the, some, image, some quick images of the field. Um, we've got uh, an acre of vegetable garden and forest garden. Um, forest garden is a system of uh, horticulture which is using the structure of a forest, replicating the structure of a forest to try and make a 
a self-contained system that creates its own nutrients and locks its own nutrients up. So you have a canopy layer, as a, an understory, a shrub layer, and a ground cover layer, and rhizomes, and it all sort of works together. And some plants fi fix nitrogen for other plants. And uh, you don't, once it's established, you don't really need to do very much with it. But it's not a very high-yielding system. Uh, we've got two acres of pasture, which is for uh, animal fodder. And this is in succession into wildflower meadow. These images are really low res. Uh, they're Polaroids, so you have to uh, forgive me for that. Um, we're also planting trees. We've got about an acre of, of uh, coppice and woodland, which is for fuel, um, future fuel and um, future building materials. And uh, ponds for water retention, uh, for irrigation, for wildlife, and for dipping into in nice summer evenings. And this is um, our, I hasten to call it a house. It's <laughs> more of a hut, uh, which was going to be a temporary house, but I've lived there for four years now. Um, it's doing very well. It's just made from post-consumer construction waste and hazel poles from a local woodland. And I live there with my partner, Kenna, who, Kenna Herney, who, who's also been completely set the project up with me, but he can't be here today. Um, OK, so I've done that bit. So I'm just going to have to rearrange things because of the, the, this problem. Could you Let's explain, Paul, um, sure. what existed when you first went there? At I mean, the field. The, yeah. the site, OK, so the field was just this four-acre open field of improved grassland, which is um, basically after, you, you probably know, after the Second World War, uh, most of England was ploughed up and improved and, and uh, planted with mono monocultures of ryegrass. And this is where most of the wildflower meadow disappeared at this point. And um, this, ironically, was called the Green Revolution at the time. And it's, it's obviously sort of been, it makes a, it, the theory was that it would make a more productive system, although that is actually questionable. Um, so it was just a four acre field and we planted hedgerows and I looked at the tithe maps from the area and discovered where the old hedges were and just reinstated them as the first thing and uh, just trying to make it as... Reducing the, the, the open area, so getting back towards a more medieval field system, really, where you have small areas with lots of, lots of hedgerows and more protection and cover for other animals and uh, that kind of thing. Yeah? Great. Um, so this is the... Plan. This is the plan of the field. This is um, we're losing a bit of it on the bottom there, but it doesn't matter. This is how we've apportioned the, the four acres to try and provide for all of the, the needs which we have for food and fuel and future shelter. And uh, the thing which I was going to show you, which I doesn't look as though I'm going to be able to, was this, this web tool which we developed. We found when we started this, there wasn't really very much easily accessible information for us to come up with this system. There isn't really, we couldn't find anywhere, for example, that tells you how many, exactly how many square meters of corn you need to grow to feed X number of chickens to get Y number of eggs every day. So we did a lot of research, and um, we put together a huge database of crops, crop yields, and nutritional values. And uh, this is how we designed this system. And this, th all of our data is now online in an interactive web tool, which I can't show you. but. Um, it basically it has a system of sliders, and you move sliders up and down, and it does four things. It shows you the nutritional value of the amount of crop that you've chosen. And you, basically, there's a table. You choose the, uh, an from an assortment of crops. You choose a kind of a, like an average diet that you'd like to eat in a day, and you move the sliders to achieve that diet. There's, there's, uh, it tells you when you're getting a, a nutritionally balanced diet, um, and then it tells you exactly how many square meters of land you need to, to grow that. And it also, you can choose the size of your house. You can choose how you're going to heat your house with different uh, renewable fuel sources. And, uh, and then it will, the, the thing that it does, which I like the most, is it shows you how many people in the UK would have to die if everybody did the same. So it's completely answering that question, which was the original criticism. So how many? Well, it completely depends on what you choose. If you go completely vegan, I mean, it's absolutely what, true what they say. If it, like, if, if everybody was vegan, then the UK would be completely self-sufficient. Um, 
if you chopped down all of the native broadleaf forest and grew red alder instead, then we'd also be self-sufficient for, for firewood if everybody lived in a 50 square meter house. Um, and if you then decide you want to just eat beef and Brussels sprouts or something and get all of your firewood from the traditional oak forests of England, then the population that the UK could support goes down to like as little as 10 million. So it completely explicates that, and it uses Kant's categorical imperative to do that. It doesn't really have a morality in the system. You just choose what you like, and then it tells you the implication. And at the back somewhere, there are some flyers with the URL um, for this system. And please pick one up, because I'd really like you all to, whoever can be bothered, to use it and save the data to our database. And then we're going to use that to create this visualization of a, a kind of a hypothetical re-territorialization of, of Kensington Gardens around the gallery here. <laughs> so it's, gonna, it's kind of a, a, an experiment in designing an off-grid uh, enclave, but also it's pretty sociological as well, I think. Right, so uh, how are we doing for time? We've got 10 more minutes. OK. All right, so... Um, sorry. So uh, at Field Club, we're, we're really interested in, in this idea of dark ecology and enmeshment. And uh, one of the things that you can see directly through gardening for the production of food is that nature holds no special privilege for the human. And we're developing, we're trying to develop what we call a post-human concept of nature. And this is what neo-agrosophy is actually about, the umbrella over all of these ideas. And this is kind of aligning somehow with current uh, thinking coming out of speculative realism. Um, so we're trying to find ways to, to codify our existence at Field Club as part of a larger food web that includes all other plants and animals that live there. And this is something that science really doesn't do at the moment. Uh, and in, in a living system based on global industrialization, the boundaries of each individual human niche are, are kind of moved to places so physically distant from the individual that the, the boundaries become unrecognizable and unquantifiable. And, one of the privileges which we've got at Field Club at the moment is that by geographically restricting the boundaries of our niche, uh, we can really begin to see how the human exists in a, in a set of biological niches, uh, just like any other living organism. And this is one of the reasons why I think gardening is really great, because the garden is one of the only places where you can really see these exchanges and begin to understand the, the exchanges between the human and non-human across their respective biological niche boundaries where you can, you can actually experience enmeshment. So this is a story of enmeshment at Field Club. Uh, so at Field Club, we have a got, we've got a deliberately low-impact land management policy. If something doesn't need cutting down, then we don't really cut it down. So there's lots of long grass around the place. And long grass is a perfect habitat for the field vole. And field voles are really popular with ecologists because they have this really dynamic uh, population fluctuation, where they sometimes sort of reach plague proportions. And uh, because of our sort of low impact land management systems that we've got at Field Club, the, the vole population got really high in some areas, and which is really great for kestrels and the barn owl and the fox that come and hunt every day at, at, at the site. And these red arrows are showing the entrances to the, the vole burrows. So the problem started when we try to plant trees for, for our first round of tree planting to, to, to grow our firewood. Every time we planted a tree, the tree would get ring barked by the field vole, and the tree would die. And we didn't understand what was happening, whether the, the field vole was actually doing this because the tree is a food source or because uh, there's, the field vole has got some kind of like phenotypic desire to control its environment and actually maintain this, this habitat as grassland because that's what is best for it. Um, so after a while of this, this happening over a couple of seasons and losing all the trees, we decided we actually had to take hold of the situation and cut the grass. And when we did, this is what happened. It's kind of like whole-scale vole slaughter. And it, it became... So many voles were getting chopped up in the, in the mowers and the strimmers that we actually started a vole graveyard. <laughs> and, and this is the paradox of enmeshment. Um, when you allow more living room for other animals and their niches, 
the more other animals that will share your territory, and then the more animals you will inevitably kill every time you try and do something, even if what you're trying to do is kind of in environmental terms admirable. Uh, and here's another example of garden scale enmeshment. So I was happily growing these cabbages, yeah? And they'd get to a certain size, about this big, and then all of a sudden they'd kind of wilt and flop over and die. So I had to investigate, did a bit of research. Turned out that uh, I had a, a cabbage root fly infestation in the garden. So I did a bit more research and found out a bit more about the life cycle of the cabbage root fly. The cabbage root fly, uh, the, the adult flies feed on this, the pollen from this plant on the left, which is a giant hogweed. And then once it's fed, it lays its eggs onto the cabbage, and then the larva hatch and eat the root. So I thought, brilliant. Here we go. All I have to do to control the situation is chop down the, the giant hogweed. So nice hot sunny day, shorts and t-shirts, machete, off across the fields, chopping down the hogweed. And of course, I get covered in hogweed juice and bits of hogweed, which then turn out to be full of a photoreactive toxin, which makes my legs completely break out in horrific, scabby, pussy wounds instantly. So went back to the house, got out the... Uh, herbal remedy books, of which we've got a few, because we've got a lot, lots of herbs there. And uh, it turns out that the only thing, that, the only practicable uh, solution to the problem is a poultice of warm cabbage leaves. So that year, <laughs> the only two cabbages that survived the cabbage root fly infestation <laughs> ended up being bandaged onto my shins. But um, what I was trying to do there was this uh, kind of an ecosystem simplification. I was trying to eliminate the resources of the cabbage root fly and deny it its niche. And this is how food production works for us. Whether we do it ourselves or whether we pay someone else to do it on an industrial scale, it's a case of removing other niches or simply assimilating them into your own niche using technological augmentation, either mechanical or, or chemical. So one of the best arguments for food production on a garden scale is that it relies upon or encourages complexity, which in terms of ecosystems means increased stability and, and interspecies equality. There are generally more niches left over for other plants and animals to exploit. But there is one animal which I don't mind simplifying out of a niche, and that's the common garden slug, the, the gardener's antichrist. And after trying lots of different control methods, which worked to varying degrees, we found that this was without a doubt the most effective method in terms of cost and labor. So once we started to employ this, this scissor method of slug control, uh, we became fascinated by its potential not only to deal out death, but to also quantify it. So that yellow blob on the back is a gallery census counter. So every time you chop, you, it counts. <laughs> and this is the slugometric device. So the next stage of this was to experiment with technological layering. Um, so for the Slugometric Device 2, it included an electric motor and a switch so that you, the user, no longer actually kill the slug yourself. You just press a switch and the motor actually does the deed. And for the third instance of this series, the Slugometric Device 3, not only is there a second layer of technology behind the motor protecting the user from the responsibility of the deed, a, tr a radio transmitter and receiver, so that a third party can actually actuate the device, exonerating the user almost entirely. <laughs> so I'm afraid if, you're, if you have an allotment and you're one of those people that puts slugs in a bucket and drives them out of town to be released in a field, you've got to get a grip. <laughs> because Vilfredo Pareto, the, the Italian economist, showed with his law of Pareto optimality, that in restricted economic systems, no individual can gain without another individual losing. And the maxim, kill to live, is true for the whole of the rest of nature and is true for the enmeshed human too. Basically, in the vegetable garden, it's a choice between killing slugs or heading back to Sainsbury's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
Well, as mm. I hate slugs, it's good to know I can oh, now clean, kill them with a very clear <laughs> eco-conscience. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, Paul. I, I know because of the technical hitch, you yeah, can't we deliver need to get quite on, yeah. the talk that you planned to, but that was fantastic. So in short, other than freedom to slaughter slugs, uh -huh. what are the pluses of your four years of, of field club? The pluses? And, and what are the, the minuses? Because well, you said you set out with an open mind yeah, sure. to investigate. I mean, the, the pluses of just living outdoors are amazing. I love it. I mean, it's not everybody's thing at all, but just to be able to wake up in the morning and open a door and, and be outside. You know, my, basically my house is four acres. And I, when it goes right, I live like a king. You know, people come and visit me and are just blown away about the, how, the quality of the food and the freshness and the quantity. Um, it's hard work. And it's hard work balancing it with other projects and part-time work as well for money. And, uh, but... Yeah, it's, I love it. It's great. You should come and visit. <laughs> I will. <laughs> you don't have to persuade me. Thank you very much. That's Pleasure. great. Pleasure. Thank you.